escrita en oro te mandé desde Celaya. Are you ready? Welcome, everyone. Are we ready, Michael? You're on. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the first Aguila storytelling event. We're so excited to have you here to join us to celebrate Cesar Chavez's birthday and Women's History Month. We uh, we want to celebrate first of all. Uh, Cesar, Chavez, Cesar Estrada Chavez's birthday, born March 31st, 1927. He married his wife, Helen, after serving in the Navy and serving our country. And he, um, he developed in the 60s, the farm workers movement, the great boycotts and his fight for justice. He also um, had eight children with Helen and several grandchildren, 31 um, grandchildren. And um, we remember him today. And you know, uh, we lost Cesar Chavez on April 23rd, 1993. And he passed in his sleep. And I remember uh, a local priest in Phoenix, Father Peacock telling me, because my mother passed in her sleep as well, is that saints pass in their sleep. And uh, we did lose him, but we celebrate not only that he was here and what he did for us, but had his legacy continues. And we have five wonderful women today joining us and telling us stories of inspiration. They're inspired by the work of Cesar Chavez and the work that they've done and their journeys. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce them and um, tell you a little bit about them before um, we get started so that we can go right into their stories. We've, we have January Contreras from Arizona, an, a fourth generation Arizonan 
who inherited some of the strongest DNA, she says, from her parents and grandparents. She's a former Maricopa Debu Deputy County Attorney, an Assistant Attorney General Arizona, and she worked with Janet Napolitano. She's worked in the White House. She founded a wonderful organization, nonprofit called Always, Arizona Legal Women and Youth Services. And um, she is going to be uh, in, the light, in, in the light soon, uh, again, working for Arizona, and she can tell you more about that. We also have Dr. Amira de la Garza from ASU at the Hugh Downs School. She is a sixth generation Tejana with family roots in, in Texas and Chihuahua. She is arrived in Phoenix, Arizona in 1990 and her, for her work with Arizona State University where she has served numerous roles both administratively and as a teaching and research faculty and presently serves an, as an associate professor and Southwest Borderlands Scholar in the Hugh Downs School of Human Communication. And she'll talk more about her story as well. She received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and continues to study whenever and whatever she can do and get away and loves to travel. Cynthia De La Rosa comes to us from Houston, Texas. She's the vice president of LULAC and she was born in Evanston, Illinois. She is, uh, comes from, her family comes from Texas. She raised, while she's raised in Chicago, she went back to Texas and has done remarkable work there as an advocate, working for her community, uh, involved in the Catholic Charities work and also youth and family services and serving migrants, working with ESL. She has an opportunity, she had an opportunity, I would thought this interesting, to work with the Brown Beret. So she contributes that to her love for La Lucha. She ascribes to the words of her Shiro Dolores Huerta that every moment is a moment to be an activist. And she'll share that with you as well. We have Valentina Zapata from Tacoma, Washington. She is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Paralegal Power Company, and is the, she's the founder of the, one of the nation's oldest paralegal firms. And through her work, she is able to advocate for Spanish-speaking and immigrant communities, as well as providing support to attorneys committed to social justice and racial equity. She also assists with minority-owned businesses, affordable and corporation services, serving all 50 states, U.S. territories. She's quite the busy woman. She's also worked in the community, speaking to women on the issues of diabetes, HIV, AIDS, working with legal aid. Um, she has a, a, a large background in working in the legal area and, and in really providing justice in, in many different states. And she'll talk to you about that as well. And last we have Emily Guerrero, M. Guerrero. She is from Fort Wayne, Indiana. She is a community activist and the founder of Mechica Arts. She uh, is a storyteller, a folk artist, an intuitive visionary of Mechica indigenous ancestry and a lifetime advocate for inclusiveness. She embodies her ancestral traditions, encouraging and inspiring audiences to expand their knowledge of diverse cultures in their midst. She, her performances include installation of arts, workshops to various age audiences, offering insight to the diverse montage of the multicultural Latino community. She's a dedicated and passionate advocate for the cultural arts. And uh, we're so happy she's here joining with us. And truly, this is an art, the art of storytelling. It is so important for us to hear these stories and to understand where we come from so that we know where we're going. Um, I want to uh, briefly introduce as well, Michael Contreras, he is with Aguila. He's our marketing guru and owner of the tech. So he is here to help out if you have any needs. And then we have our program director, Monica Avila, who's with us. And she is also here to help out in any way that we can with our, our first launch of our Aguila storytelling. We're going to turn it over now to our storytellers. And we start with um, January Contreras. It's January here. There she is. And hi, everybody. Uh, well, I'm really glad to join you, uh, Rosemary, who I respect and admire so much. Thanks for inviting me and all of these amazing women to be a part of this with all the people, all the young people of Aguila. Um, I myself have a son who 
was in the program and I've seen how it grows leadership uh, where we need it the most. So I'm really happy to be here with all of you because I know how impressive uh, all these young people in the program are. Uh, so my name is January Contreras. I am uh, from Arizona. My family has lived here for a very long time. Some of the most amazing uh, memories for me now, I have lost all of my grandparents, but my maternal grandparents are, I was very close to, and I, I lived with them for a few years. And um, hearing their stories, they grew up on the Southern Arizona border. My grandfather, my tata from Nogales, one of five brothers, who went to World War II, uh, and my Nana, who grew up in Tubac and attended the territorial one-room schoolhouse that is still there in Tubac, that's preserved. Um, and so I grew up with a real pride in being an Arizonan, and I still have that with me. Um, so I grew up here in Phoenix. My parents, my dad was in the Air Force and then joined the post office, and uh, my mom, graduated from college from ASU while I was um, growing up. So it was really neat to see her break some of those barriers because it was not common at the time. Um, she was already single and uh, divorced from my dad and, and moving on to earn her degree. Uh, and both of my parents then actually working at the post office. Um, I grew up in Phoenix and then went down to Tucson where I attended the University of Arizona. So if there's any wildcats or, or uh, to be wildcats to be out there, uh, I highly recommend the U of A. Uh, it was a great place for me. I learned so much about myself and growing into independence there at the U of A was really something amazing. It's also where I met my husband. Uh, so I met my husband like a month after I turned 19. And now we're about to celebrate our 27th wedding anniversary next week. Uh, and we have two sons who are 19 and 17 and very lucky that way uh, in terms of being able to have a partner in life who is um, loving and respectful. And we share a lot of our dreams with each other and try to help them come true. Um, I will say for me, I didn't know I wanted to be an attorney. So I, I don't know if anyone out there wants to be an attorney. I didn't have that in my mind. Quite frankly, I didn't know any attorneys um, growing up. But when I graduated from college, um, I worked actually at a TV station very briefly. I studied media, which would now be called broadcast journalism or journalism. Um, and we moved to California and I worked at a TV station in Oxnard, California. And, you know, it's fitting uh, since today is Cesar Chavez Day and we're recognizing his leadership and the leadership of all these women on the call and all of the, uh, those that are in the audience, to, you know, to keep growing your own leadership. Um, when I worked at that TV station in Oxnard, California, I actually uh, reported on a school that was being opened in the name of Cesar Chavez. So it was a new Cesar Chavez school. Uh, I went out there with my cameraman and I was interviewing people, including the family of Cesar Chavez. Uh, there were some famous actors who were there because they admired Cesar Chavez so much. And it was really neat because the, it was obvious that the kids had studied um, you know, Cesar Chavez and his legacy of leadership uh, and because the school was named something prior to that, something different. And they were unveiling it as a Cesar Chavez school. And so I got to interview all these um, little for first and second graders and hearing their pride in Cesar Chavez and all that he did for workers and working families in the fields um, and really what that meant for working people throughout the country uh, really came through. And it was one of the, well, it was one of my most favorite memories from that part of my life. I did go on then and decided I did wanna go to law school. It was very appealing to me 
to try to be a problem solver instead of just um, watching problems and issues, but actually wanting to be a part of solving them. And I felt like the law provided a very unique way of um, having power. And so for me, it was very much, I didn't want to be powerless for myself and I didn't want to be powerless for other people. And for me, earning a law degree was a huge way of having that power, not for power's sake, not to be important, but to have <clears throat> some avenues, some tools, some um, authority to be able to try to help people, to be able to try to right wrongs, um, and to be able to try to make justice happen. <clears throat> and so I started studying for the LSAT. Um, you know, I, I couldn't afford a class for the LSAT, a prep course or anything like that. But the law school uh, sent me some books once they knew that I wasn't taking a prep course. And I studied with those books. And um, by the next fall, I was starting in law school uh, back at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, and it was, uh, you know, the right path. I'm so glad that I listened to where I felt called to at that moment because I have really loved being a lawyer. Um, throughout my career, I've just had some amazing opportunities, um, you know, working as a prosecutor of elder abuse crimes, you know, prosecuting people who have abused patients in nursing homes. Um, now, um, you know, in my career, having been a lawyer in so many different ways and just really being proud of that work. Uh, so I started out as a prosecutor ended up working for Governor Napolitano um, at that time. So that was about 2005 or so um, when she became, you know, when I started to work for her at the governor's office. And then um, when she went to join the Obama administration in Washington DC as a cabinet member, uh, I went with her to DC and joined the Obama administration. And that was just a whole new world, a whole new set of experiences um, that was really amazing. So my whole family went, my, my husband, my two kids, my mom and our beagle, we all packed up and we went to DC. And um, I had the amazing privilege of being able to work to try to make, uh, improve the situation for victims of crimes who were immigrants because unfortunately what was happening at the time is uh, there were people who were undocumented who would call 911 for help because they'd been beaten or they had something else awful happen to them. And instead of being helped when they called 911, they ended up being um, detained. And it was awful, it was horrible, uh, something that we never wanted to have happen again. And so to be tapped um, as one of the leaders of trying to change policy, uh, making new training for law enforcement around the country uh, and helping them understand that we need to treat all victims with dignity. Uh, it was really uh, some of the work that I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of in my career. When I left the Obama administration, I came home and I had worked so much in the space of domestic violence survivors and trafficking survivors and victims of crime that I really wanted to do that full time. And I really felt called to start a nonprofit organization. Uh, and I did. So it was very amazing. I uh, came home and I wrote some grant applications to, to make sure I could get some funding and started a nonprofit legal aid center. We're called Arizona Legal Women and Youth Services. We go by always. Uh, and we've been able to work with Aguila students and others. Um, actually, when DACA was first, uh, e first effective, the very first day it went into effect, um, I helped coordinate two DACA clinics with Aguila. Uh, and it was amazing, it was beautiful, just seeing all these young people and their families come in who 
just never knew if they would have an opportunity to work and live in the United States without the threat of uh, being told they don't belong here. And so, um, you know, it's been a, it's just such an amazing journey. So now always the legal aid organization I run is about seven years old. We've helped so many people. We serve um, young people who are dealing with really the worst circumstances, uh, with homelessness, with abuse, with trafficking, and the foster care system. And we help them in immigration hearings and family court and criminal courts. Uh, and we're very proud of all of our clients and we're so, we feel so lucky and so blessed to be able to be a part of their journey. Um, so, and that's what I do to this day. I have had the opportunity to run for office. Uh, it was amazing. We need people in government who we can trust to be fair, uh, who want all people to succeed. Uh, and that's something that I believe deeply in. Uh, I think as we, you know, there, there are a lot of women here who have the chance to speak. So I'll just end with um, sharing one of my most precious memories. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the most beautiful memories of my entire life is when I got to take my Nana to the White House. Um, my Nana is, again, I, I lived with my Nana and Tata for a few years when I was young. My parents worked nights. And um, my Nana was not a traveler. Like she liked to travel, but she was afraid of airplanes. Uh, but I flew her and my cousin who was a, a junior at North High, uh, and I flew them out to DC. And walking with them to the White House, uh, and particularly when we were coming out of the White House, my Nana, who's a very, um, I lost her just this past year, but she's a very, you know, a tough woman. She's not particularly emotional. But when we were walking out of the White House and you've got these big, beautiful white columns um, and she got teary eyed and she said, um, I never thought someone like me would be in the White House. And it was, um, just a really powerful moment for me because she didn't even just say, I never thought I would be in the White House. She said, I never thought someone like me would be there. And it just really flooded me with emotions of how her ancestors, um, where they started, what kind of journeys they've had and our DNA traveling all these generations, um, all the way there to the White House and and that I wasn't unique. There were other people like me who we didn't have money. We weren't wealthy. We didn't have, you know, political connections other than through our work. We had proven that we cared about public service, that we cared about people and been able to reach these um, positions where then I had the ability to share it with my family. And uh, nothing could mean more to me um, than sharing my journey with my family because I would not have been able to do any of the things I've done without them. So I shared that with you. Uh, you know, I look forward to all the beautiful moments that you know, the young people on this call that you will have. You will surprise yourself. Uh, you will um, make your families and yourselves so proud. Uh, and I look forward here to hearing all the other women on this call because I have heard some of their stories and I, it's a real privilege to be here with all of them as well. Thank you. Thank you, January. Thank you so very much. And now we move over to uh, Professor Amira de la Garza from Arizona State University. Hello, everybody. Uh, my voice is a little uh, weak but my heart is very powerful right now. So if you can't hear my voice, it's because I have allergies uh, and I hadn't talked to anybody today until I started to get ready for this. Uh, and I didn't realize my voice sounded like this. Uh, but I want to say uh, thank you to everybody who is here, everybody who has signed up and shown up for this webinar, to Aguila, uh, a great, great organization that I, I've enjoyed uh, supporting over the years and helping with the students and the mothers and, and the families uh, 
here in Arizona. Uh, and I'm, I'm honored to be here on the birthday of Cesar Chavez, uh, because I think that Cesar Chavez uh, has given all of us who are uh, Latina, Latinos, uh, so much pride in the strength and the dignity that we can have. One of the things that I was really uh, drawn to for this event was that, that it said that they were going to put together the celebration of Cesar Chavez with uh, instead of history, herstory, that we're going to talk about the, the way the women carry the stories of, of our people. And, uh, and what came to my mind was that in Spanish, if we say historia, it's la historia, that we know in Spanish that history is feminine. It is, a, it is, it is carried in the way we tell the stories. So I've been thinking about all my uh, madrinas and abuelas and the comadres of my of my mother uh all the all the madres sagradas that all the mothers that have been so sacred and strong and dignified and and told us stories even when we didn't know we were hearing stories and i i really hope that that what i've chosen to share with you today can honor them and can uh touch you in a place that makes you realize what you have to share uh, to keep to keep our traditions alive. I'm uh, like like we said in the introduction. I'm a sixth generation Tejana, and maybe longer. We just don't know because the the history was not kept that way. Uh, and I have uh, ancestry in in what we know of as the states of Chihuahua and Coahuila, uh, south of of Texas. But I came to Arizona in 1990 as a professor at Arizona State University. And a lot of my, of my experience has been uh, learning how, how united we are as peoples because we're people that travel, people that, that help each other when we're in really difficult situations. And that all of that is connected to, to how much we come from a people that, that know and love and, and enjoy working in all, all areas of, of our society. And one of the things that I grew up with from, uh, hearing from my, from my abuelo, uh, MR Manuel Ramirez uh, Gonzalez, and my father and that whole side of my family was how, how important education was. And I don't think I would be a professor if, if I hadn't heard that so much. So I chose a story to tell you today that comes from my family's history uh, that I think is a story that speaks to, that can speak to all of us and that also will will show how the, the power of the voice of a woman is really important and that a lot of times we tell the stories and we forget the women that have made the story possible. So I want to I want to start by telling you I'm from a little place called Fort Stockton and if you've ever traveled on I-10 from California all the way to Houston out to Florida you had to go through my hometown because it's right in the middle of the road between uh, El Paso and San Antonio. And there's nobody who's driving on that road who doesn't either, either have to stop for gasoline, for food, or to go to the bathroom, because it's, it's, it's that long, long road. If you've ever been on it, you know what it's like. But, but before it was called Fort Stockton, they used to just call it El Comanche, like the Comanche, El Comanche, because there, there were natural springs there, beautiful water that flowed from an ojo under the ground. It would fill with the water. And it was, it was at the place where the, where the Lipan Apache and the, and the Comanche would cross on their, on their migration paths. And they would stop there at, that, at, the, at the watering hole there. So it was a very important place. And so, of course, when, when colonizers and settlers and eventually the American military would come, they wanted to be where the water was. So after the, after the Civil War, uh, the US government sent uh, troops to go to places in Fort, what's now called Fort Davis and Fort Stockton and set up troops in the places where the Native Americans would be most likely to come. And so they, they set these, these uh, forts up there and they named the town that. And a lot of people think that's when the town started, but our people had been there for, uh, for at least a hundred years uh, at that time in the mid 1800s, right after the civil war. 
uh, they, they put a street up in the middle of our town called Division Street, division, like dividing. And north of that street was where the fort and the Anglo and the American uh, people would come. And south of that street was the Mexican side of town. It was also where they had the cemetery for the Buffalo soldiers who were the African-American soldiers that came after the Civil War, after they'd been uh, emancipated from slavery and they were in the US Army, they did not have the right to be buried in the, in the cemetery with the white people, neither did the Mexicans. And so everything was south of that on Division Street. And that's the history of where my, my family, my familia had been living. Uh, my, uh, and so, so that's like in the mid 1800s. Okay, so let's, let's go fast forward now. We're in, in uh, eight, 1946 and uh, the town passes a law that in July of 1946, they passed a law that if you were of Latin American descent, like if we came from, from Latin America, basically they meant Mexican at that time, uh, that if you came from Latin American descent, you could not swim in the water of those springs, you could not drink the water from the springs, and you could not stand anywhere near them so that you could look at the water, it was a, which is an insane law. So my abuelo, Manuel MR, Papa MR is what we called him. And, uh, and my, my abuela, uh, Carmen, Mama Carmelita is what we called her. She was pregnant with my tío Oscar, who was gonna be born in 1947. And he took her and they stood up on top of a, of a little uh, incline on the, on, the, uh, on the side of the springs and they just stood there and looked at the water. Uh, this is an act of civil disobedience. It's a la they were uh, disobeying the law, but we never read Thoreau and all the things that, that we learn in school is where these things come from. No, this is in our blood. This is who we are. We're, we're strong, dignified people. And they stood there to look at the water. And my, my, my Papa Amar told me that uh, si mi papá estuvo aquí antes de que ellos llegaran. I mean, his father had been there long before the, the people came and told them they couldn't be there. And so they stood there and, and, a, and, a, and a man came over and, and told him, hey, MR, you know, you can't be standing here. Uh, and, and what my Papa MR told me is like, you can't tell me where I can stand. And they said, well, you know, MR, it's against the law for you to be here. And then they went and they grabbed my grandmother by the arm. And my, my Papa MR said that when they touched his wife, my abuela, who was pregnant at the time, that at that moment, he just felt all this rabia, all this anger and said, they are not going to be able to do this to us anymore. They had to leave. So at that time, the high school in the town, they had a, a high school that was an accredited high school so that if you graduated, you could go to college and only white Anglo students could go to that high school. They had another high school that was where the, the Mexicanos and the African-Americans and others could go, but that school was not accredited. So if you graduated from that high school, you couldn't go to college. So what my Papa MR and another man by the name of Manuel Nunez, uh, they did is they got together with the LULAC and the GI Forum, and they, they got in touch with LBJ, who one day was gonna be the president of the United States, but he had not even been a Senator yet. He worked with the, with the youth forum in, in Southwest Texas, in those areas. And they organized to, to have the braceros who were coming from Mexico with permits from the US government to, to work in the fields. He, he arranged for no braceros to be allowed to come and help these farmers and these ranchers unless they opened that school so that, so that we could go to that school. And, and what happened is then they then they saw my uh, Papa Amar as kind of being like the ringleader because because he I, I kind of have that fire that, that came from that family. I'm very proud of that, very humble. But he, he, he was the fighter here and he had two years of, of school. He was, uh, I think he went to school when he was like five and six and that's it. He was self-educated uh, and he, he was fighting for this. So they started a petition and they had all the Anglo white, uh, property owners and store owners and everything signed this petition that said that no Mexicanos could go to any of the stores. They, they were not allowed there unless they would stop this protest. And they tried to, 
to kill my, my grandfather several times. But what I want to tell you about is when the last time, because they, they did it three times, they tried to kill him and they were going to lynch him. They were going to take him and on their own, find him and kill him to, to stop this whole thing. So on this one night, they went to, to the house and uh, they, they went up to the door and my, my, uh, what the, the way that my, my abuelita told me is it was dark and, uh, and they heard them coming and uh, my abuelita Carmen went to the door and she opened the door and could see these four Anglo men that were standing out there with rifles and carrying a burlap bag. And they wanted to know, where's MR? And she told him that he wasn't there and she refused to move from there. And they kept pushing and pushing and, they, and finally they left and he was hiding in the back. He'd been hiding behind something. And, and she saved his life. She didn't only save his life, she saved that movement. She saved the ability of us to have a possibility of going to school because eventually with the help of LBJ and, and the GI Forum and LULAC and, and, this, and this boycott from the Braceros, they had to open the school. They had to let uh, the Mexicanos go to, uh, go to the accredited high school. And if it hadn't been for that, my father never would have gotten a high school diploma. My mother never would have gotten a, a high school diploma. And, and my town was very proud of education because of that piece of history. But we, what we don't hear is that it was my abuela Carmen that made that possible in many, many ways. And, and when you think back, she came to the United States in 1928 with my bisabuela, my great grandmother, Maria Cristina. And they came right after the revolution had ended uh, during the Cristero movement because they were, they were actually killing people for going to church in Mexico. And you need to read about that if you haven't. And, and they, uh, so they came to, to Texas and they met my, my, my abuelo and they got married in 1929. And, uh, but before that, she was born and she had lived with my, my, my bisabuela, my great grandmother, Maria Cristina. They had lived only women because all the men had gone off to fight in the Mexican Revolution. So from the time she was uh, four years old until she was, uh, until she was 10 years old, those six years, six years that my great grandfather was gone fighting for the revolution, she had been around strong, strong women that knew how to defend themselves against people who came to the door with guns. And, and what we need to remember is in every situation where we see ourselves doing little things, where we then tell the story later and we forget about the, the mujeres that were, that were speaking and standing up, we need to tell those stories. And we need to remember that every time we stand up for ourselves, and every time we protect another person, we are doing really, really good work for our people. And I, I just want to, uh, to say thank you to my abuelo and my abuela and, and all the people that fought for me to be able to have education. And I want all of you to, to be really proud of the women in your family who have protected you and defended you because that is, that is a sacred and treasured uh, heritage. And to close, I'd like to say, Cesar Chavez and his wife and their family went and lived in San Jose in, a, in what had been a barrio that was called Sal Si Puedes, that if you get out of here if you can, escape if you can. And eventually with uh, Dolores Huerta gave the phrase Si Se Puede to, to Cesar Chavez. A si Se Puede Salir. We can get out of the silence. We can get out of being ignored. We can get out of poverty. We can get out of the situations that, that don't give us health care. Si sí se puede. And the mujeres know that. Si sí se puede. Thank you. Thank you, Professor de la Garza. Thank you so very much. Si sí se puede. And off we go to Texas to Cynthia de la Rosa. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you're on. Oh, okay. My story is one of believing in yourself, knowing that your ancestors, that 
your strength, your pride, your love of your people makes things happen. Um, I did not get a formal education and I am, and by that I mean a higher education, but I do believe that it's very, very important to have that. And now I have literally no excuse to, to do that for myself. And um, it is a goal of mine. Um, my family is from Catula, Texas. And we, uh, my mom and dad, moved to Chicago when they were younger. And that's where I was born and raised. Um, we moved down to Catula later on in my teenage years. And um, I, I literally scratched and fought tooth and nail for every position I got. I was not going to be not hurt. I was going to be hurt. Um, whatever that took, working out in the fields with my parents. As I grew older, the rancheros, the ranchmen, they'd see me coming and they'd take their hat off and they'd slap their leg and they were like, dang, here she comes. <laughs> because I was not going to allow them to spray us with chemicals while we were out there working in the fields. And that led me to go work with migrant health care with women who were actually carrying the effects of these chemical sprays that were happening and helping them through their process of healing and being heard. Um, then moving on to other positions like that, Hoylton Youth and Family Services. Um, you know, and each step, I would think to myself, I'm not supposed to be here. I shouldn't have got that job, that self doubt, you know, just kind of, but no, you are, and I am. We're supposed to be there, heard listen to and you for me it's been about reaching back and bringing up the next person and instilling in them the belief that si se puede yes you can every step of the way um i worked with catholic charity I did a lot of work there uh, with adoptions and things of that nature. Um, with Hoyleton Youth and Family Services, I did a lot of work um, going to visit families that were about to either lose their children or because there was a lack of understanding, cultural understanding. Um, there was a lot of indigenous people that had come into Washington Park at that time. And so they didn't sleep on a bed. And the older girl always took care of the household. Made tortillas, cafecito, tortillas, bread, uh, corn tortillas, things of this nature, the caregiver, the caretaker. And that was just a norm, you know. So here I was navigating a very fine line so that they could keep their children and making my, my partners, you know, at work and here in the United States have an understanding of, of these cultural differences. Um, so things like that. Um, what else? I'm saying um a lot. I'm sorry. But um, here we go. So moving along, Michigan, 
working with folks out in the field, teaching them English so that they could call 911 so that the women, and there was another area where I had to walk fine lines. There would be domestic violence, things of that issue, the women needing physical medical checkups, the husband's not allowing it, a lot of machismo going on and um, wanting to make sure that they got their needs met, um, things of that nature, and also keeping their husbands happy so that I could have access to the women to take them to go do these things. So a lot of understanding going into play with all these jobs, different jobs that I had no formal training in. I simply used what was given to me by my creator and by my ancestors and by my my position. I'm the oldest of four sisters. So it it, it was my job to take care of my sisters, my job to take care of my mama when she came home from work tired. So and still go to school, you know, and and do what I had to do. It was a lot of work, but I loved it. And I continued to do that work throughout my whole life um, to the point where, now, you know, here I am, Houston, Texas, many, many years later, never giving up to be the voice of our gente, never. Anywhere I saw an injustice, I had my foot in the door. I would get, uh, Undocumented people are very scared to use their voice for fear of being deported or, you know, things of that nature. So they tend to stay in the background and and not really say much. So one of the things that I do is I I still do it. I go out and I, I get in touch with these populations this poor part of the population and I talk to them and I ask them about their their needs I ask them what you know they feel about this or about that in conversation because sometimes they don't want to share but I put them at ease and we chat and I carry their voice forward I carry their voice to where I sit now as vice president of a LULAC chapter here in Houston, Texas. You know, we we catch things. We we they try and slide them past us, these little sly laws, you know, but we catch them like for instance, the one that they're trying to pass now, I believe it's HB7 and SB6, where they're trying to make it you know, illegal for you to have food and water in, in line where they're trying to take away people's right to give somebody else a ride to the voting area, uh, limiting the ballot boxes. This is all being done, and we know why, uh, against marginalized groups, which is ourselves and others. Um, and so we are drafting a lawsuit right now through LULAC to, as an injunction so that we can buy time in order to awaken all our brothers and sisters, you know, to the fight, wake up. This is what they're doing to us. Um, and we're not going to let that go. Things of that nature, you know, today I have, Somebody used the word power. I am, I, I, I have a power now that I can use for la lucha, for la gente. Um, I'm the first in my family, really honestly, to have even done those type of things. And since I was little, I just knew, you know, that there was a greater purpose my soul was here for. And so I have fought tirelessly for our people. 
to be heard, to not be heard, to have that voice. And I do carry it forward. I'm a fighter. I, I have been a fighter since day one. And I know a lot of you are. Look where you're at. Look where you're at. Your moment in the sun. How beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. You know, you carry the hopes and the dream. The power and the strength of your moms, your abuela, your tia. Toda esa gente, all those people are behind you, they're watching. You make these beautiful strides, you know, to get your degree and to go out there and not forget, you know, the strength that you carry, the message you carry. Que si se puede, todo se puede. Like my family, like I said, we were farm workers. Um, to this day, some still work the circuit, you know, just don't ever give up. Every time a door closed on me, I opened up another one. Whether I had to use my boots or not, doesn't matter. I opened that door and, you know, found a way. I made a way for us to be heard, for our stories to be told. Nobody taking advantage, you know, of, of us. I wasn't going to allow it, not on my watch. And I do, I am a little rough around the edges and such, but it has served its purpose in the jobs that I've done. Um, but like I said, it's become very apparent that I would love to have my degree on the wall, you know? So I'm. that's my goal in life at this time now, because I'm at this point now with LULAC and stuff like that, I get to do really awesome things as well. Um, we just did a Cesar Chavez, uh, we gave a, a wonderful, um, what is it? Hold on here. A wonderful plaque to a beautiful superintendent, uh, Dr. Judith Garner, I believe her name is. And she has worked tirelessly for us as well. Um, I was able to present her with that. You know, so we have beautiful moments. It just, I, I am just so proud to be with all of these women, the heartbeat of who we represent. Um, Dolores Huerta, I got to meet her. And I remember just what she said. Every moment is a moment to be an activist. And it is one love. It is. You know, we're all here for each other. Don't forget that. And so I have a hard time sharing things like that about myself and what I've done in this and that. So if I've, oh, if I've missed anything here, let's see. There's more kids, just can't remember right now. <laughs> but I think I've shared the gist of it. Believe in yourself. Keep going, keep moving forward. Don't stop. Get that degree and use it. Use it wisely. Thank you. And I think I'm going to wrap it up with that right there. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all that you do. We love you. And next we have Valentina from Tacoma, Washington. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate um, being on the panel with everyone. I sat by the window over here, like uh, in Washington, where we usually have to beg for sun, and there was actually a lot of sun. So I think I figured that out at this point. Um, first of all, thank you.
Thank you so much to um, Aguila for hosting this event. And thank you so much to all of the ladies on the panel, as well as Rosemary and uh, Michael and everyone who's helped organize this event. Um, and it, additionally, thank you to all of the ancestors of those people that I just mentioned. I can't even imagine just sitting here listening to all the stories and being surrounded by these amazing, beautiful women. Uh, it, it, I can't help but think of, uh, and as you, as you reference your ancestors, I can't help but think of how the seven generations past that brought you here today to do the work you're doing and I'm really humbled to be part of this one. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, as Rosemary uh, started, uh, explained briefly uh, at the beginning, I am, um, I, I do run a paralegal uh, business and I am, um, <clears throat> I have I do I do uh, service the entire United States, but I've uh, grew up mostly in Wyoming because my grandmother came uh, here through the Bracero program uh, that was um, mentioned earlier, which, as most of my uh, fellow panelists know, uh, the Department of Labor later denounced as quote unquote modern day slavery and um, she settled in a farming community in Torrington, Wyoming. And so when I think about what Cesar Chavez means to me, um, uh, it all of my stories um, are her story, obviously. And when I think of what Cesar Chavez means to me, I think of uh, I think of Torrington, Wyoming. So today, I'm going to share with you some uh, uh, some, uh, some stories about uh, about Torrington specifically, actually. Uh, and I did um, I did prepare this ahead of time, and I wrote it out. And I have my daughter here trying to help me with some background music, so you guys can really feel this. So uh, here we go. I grew up in, the, oh, uh, pardon me, before I get to that part, I do want to just also um, give a uh, uh, give a quick shout out to Legal Aid of Nebraska. I, like I said, I'm so happy to be here with all these ladies. It's really a blessing that we all came together. Um, but Le Legal Aid of Nebraska, I actually got to work with their um, migrant education um, project where they were uh, the, one of the last projects that actually went out to the fields to educate people in Nebraska. Um, because, um, and as my story will talk about, um, that was uh, post Monsanto. We didn't have a lot of work to do because um, our people had moved from the fields mostly to restaurant work at by that time, but um, but nonetheless that was amazing, awesome um, experience that helped me uh, reconnect my to my roots. My mother being the most wet out of all of my grandmother's children was the only one that never worked the fields, so I didn't hear a lot of those stories, and I had to to to, to find this information kind of on my own. Um, so. Um, Having said that, I'll get into my story here. I grew up in the 90s, and while many people associate that with frosted tip hairstyles and boy bands, it was also the last decade that the migrant field workers would light up our rural towns in the summer. Cuando se fueron las nieves de enero y llegaron las flores de mayo, the migrant workers would go from state to state, following the crops and bringing life to the small seco towns they worked near. That was the last era before Monsanto, before social media, before the internet was a daily part of our lives. Our queen of Tejano music, Selena, was as alive as the parks when they're booming with gente. And while I would later come to understand that the majority of them were from Mexico, we still called them all Tejanos. And there was no disputing, Tejanos rigorously worked the fields every minute of daylight. Migrant season brought new faces and old familiar smiles to the farming communities. The summer before my junior year in high school, I met a Tejana named Arisali. The most natural relationships we have are our friendships. And our friendship felt as natural to me as Semillas de Frijol. She was so humble and down to earth. And neither one of us was afraid to have the loudest laugh in the room. <clears throat> we both worked except she worked the field. She made more money than I did working at Taco John's, but she worked much harder. My earliest shift started at 10 in the morning while all of her shifts started at sunrise. We were just 15 years old, but she had to be up for work at 3.30 in the morning. We spent our money similarly as well. The majority of it went back to our parents or in my case, my grandmother. We also bought our own personal care products and other things to help up the house. When I did this around my other friends, I felt poor. <laughs> but when Ronda Araceli felt rich to be able to contribute to our homes. 
out of Sally and I would be front and center before my grandmother's huge tube TV when Selena would come on the only Spanish channel our town had access to. Together, we learned Selena's dance moves and her live performances. Most of my friends in my hometown of Cheyenne, Wyoming, didn't even know who Selena was at that time. That summer was so much fun that I decided to stay in Torrington and go to school there. I was hoping Araceli would try to move there too. She was my best friend. The day after the fair had left town, I went to Araceli's house to tell her I was going to stay and suggest she should too. But when I got there, she was busily packing all of her things. They were leaving that day. I was shocked. I had so many questions. I didn't understand why they had to leave so soon. Araceli looked at me as if I was clueless and told me that the field work was done. All the fields are clean. They have to go now. This was horrible news, but she presented it so matter of factly and even maintained her buena onda. There were still at least a few more weeks left of summer. Why couldn't they just relax a little? That's when I first began to understand what an H1B1 visa was. I wondered how I could be 15 years old and just now understanding this. She told me that she would get in trouble with the law if she stayed. That was so beyond my comprehension at the time. She was 15 years old. I asked her, why couldn't she just go to school in Torrington with me? She laughed at me and told me she hadn't got to go to school for years. She told me schools for people with money or papers and explained that she doesn't live in Texas. She lives in Mexico and she's only able to come up here to the United States to work the fields. And once the work is done, she has to return. She spoke English just as well as I did. She was just another Chicana. She was just like me in so many ways, yet our opportunities were completely different and determined at birth. She left that day and I never saw her again. That was the last summer Selena was alive too. That year, I started my junior year at Torrington High School. Oddly, the town that was rich with beautiful Mex people with Mexican roots only had about two dozen kids of Mexican descent enrolled in its high school. Torrington went from feeling like a comfortable old familiar home to a foreign land once I went to school there. I was lucky to start the year with seven of my homegirls, but by the time the first semester ended, there were only a few of us left. The social caste system was more apparent in that high school and I began to be resentful. To be honest, I've been reeling since third grade when I came to understand the aliens that were coming for us that I kept hearing about on TV during election season were actually just my Mexican family. Then one day while in American history class, I angrily complained about there only being one paragraph in the entire book about Mexicans, and we are America. Mr. Dugan immediately agreed and confessed he brought it up numerous times to his superiors but got nowhere. He reminded us again that he was retiring that year. And as such, he wasn't afraid to teach the way he wanted to. He apologized for not being more of a resource, but allowed all of us Chicano kids to bring in all the Chicano history we could find for the remainder of that year. That class was Chicano studies. I felt a lot of pressure to constantly be bringing new information to the class, considering I was the mandona that complained about not having enough. <laughs> the first person we talked about was Cesar Chavez. He had passed away just a few years before this, and there seemed to be a lot of information about him. It wasn't until after meeting Araceli that summer that I could truly connect my understanding of what Cesar did for our people. Once I realized that he was one of the few people fighting for farm workers, I began to understand. Despite my classmates already speaking extensively about him, I continued to study him. As most of the limited information on Chicano studies that I could find at the time in that area pertained to Cesar. So I just read everything I could find. The more I studied Cesar, the more I found. I found Dolores Huerta, I found Yo Soy Joaquin, and Nonviolent Solutions, and the English Dictionary's first definition of Chicano. I found the Mexican excellence in the fact that my grandmother was a landowner. I found the humility and pride in the joke my tío would make about having to sweep the floor when they first purchased the home, and it literally didn't have a floor. I found stability and warmth on that floor that my tío eventually built for her as I grew up walking barefoot over the floor register's hot grate. And all this research into civil rights Cesar fought for took me back to one of my first childhood memories, to a time that one of my grandmother's compadres was hit by a train while in town for migrant season. 
The entire bottom of his torso was gone. He would lay on the sofa with the blood soaked white sheet wrapped around his waist. My mom and grandmother took turns caring for him in each of their homes. As a four year old child, it was traumatic to see them clean and change his dressings. My mom and grandmother never guarded my eyes against it though. My grandmother always made a point for me to know la vida es dura. At the time, I didn't understand why my family was taking care of him and he was not in a hospital. I had visited much less severely injured people in hospitals. I came to learn that it was determined at birth whether he would be allowed basic medical care in the United States. It also began to be apparent to me that my mom and grandmother took care of him because they were in positions to do so. They were not nurses or doctors, yet they were able to care for him. And from a young age, it was in, uh, uh, instilled in me to do what you can for people with the privilege you've been born with, just like so many of us do for each other, like Cesar Chavez lived his life doing. Cesar was our advocate. He didn't have to be an attorney to advocate, but he did have to work with attorneys to accomplish his goals. Attorneys are the only advocates who have direct access to the laws we write. The, these laws determine how our children and sick people are cared for. It was indeed attorneys Gustavo Garcia and Carlos Cardena that presented the very first civil rights case, Hernandez versus Texas, before our Supreme Court. And an attorney that gave Cesar Chavez's father poor legal advice instead of fighting for him when their land was stolen. As a paralegal in the legal field, it is apparent to me that not enough people with the heart and compassion for justice like Cesar Chavez had are choosing to pursue law school and instead are opting for other humanitarian fields like social work. If you've never considered pursuing a jurist doctor to make social change, I would like to encourage you to do so. You would be in a much more powerful position to make true and lasting changes that affect our most vulnerable people like January and is doing with her Juris Doctor. Ultimately, Cesar Chavez means to me, what Cesar Chavez means to me can be summed up by this quote from him. The love for justice that is in us is not only the best part of our being, but is also the most true to our nature. Thank you. Valentina, how beautiful. Thank you so much. And the music, what a wonderful added touch. Thank you, hermana. And last we have, pobrecita, she's over there in Indiana where it's really late. Emily Guerrero, we call her M. Hi there, I had to unmute. Whew. So many inspiring stories, and I am so honored to hear them and receive them and continue to be inspired by them. I'm far north, and my family, you know, comes from Monterrey, Mexico, from the Coahuila area, up through the Eagle Pass into San Antonio. I have grandparents who owned land in Cotula, Texas. Um, when the war started and my deals went to World War II, they moved to Chicago so they could be close to the Red Cross to be in communication with them. And so that's how we come to be in Chicago and what people call as Lorteñas. We um, moved north and it was quite a culture shock to move from a small community like San Antonio and Cotula and Taylor, Texas, to one of the most metropolitan cities in the world, Chicago. And you know, my grandparents brought all the traditions and the costumbres that they grew up with and instilled in my parents, but it was a real challenge because my parents came and were needing to assimilate. And in that assimilation, speak English and send their children to, to elementary and high school, which was English. And so we were living between two cultures where we would come home from school and todos hablaron español. Everybody spoke Spanish, but then our teachers would say, don't speak Spanish to your children and don't encourage them to speak Spanish because they'll fail in school. So then we were not encouraged to speak Spanish and now I am pocha, Spanish speaking, but still proud of what I do know and the customs and traditions that I still carry forward into these next generations, that of my sons and that of their children too. You know, when I lived in Chicago and going through school and not seeing role models that look like me or my mother or my family, 
um, I, I was challenged by my identity because of course there were the derogatories, there were the terrible names that we were called and it was trying to keep our chin up and trying to fight for our dignity and saying, that's not who I am, you don't define me. But as a child, I didn't have those words. I just would go home and say to my mom, why did they call me this and what does that mean? And so, you know, we went from being called uh, Mexicanas and we were then Spanish and then they said we were Chicanas and that's the one that really spoke to me and I hung on to identifying as a Chicana because by that time in my life, I finally did have some positive role models who were Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Cesar looked just like my tios. He looked just like my dad. He, he was familia. And then Dolores, you know, that was my big sister's name, Dolores. And this is Dolores Huerta, who was the first female vice president of a national union in this country. And she was a mother and she was a sister and a tia and a prima. And I thought, you know, if Dolores can do this, we need to do our part. So I started to protest in Chicago and I started to join the boycott against the lettuce buying and events buying grapes. And I started picketing through with friends from high school. And I started to resist and learn that it was important to raise our voices collectively. We were gathering as young Chicanos and Chicanas requesting a better education, requesting to have services. In our town of Chicago, I lived in uh, the barrio close to Pilsen and Little Village, and we were predominantly Latinos. But this high school there was the oldest one in the entire city. And when my sister was in class, the physical education class was on the third floor and she was on the second floor like this with her book because when they were doing exercise in the class above, pieces of the ceilings would fall on their head. And nobody did anything about that or cared about that. In the winter time, we had to wear our coats because the heat wasn't working. There was no insulation, there were broken windows. So my friends and I joined the protest with parents and community people in the neighborhood. And we went downtown and we protested against the mayor daily, daily machine. My mom saw me on television gritando, you know, holding signs. And when I got home, she said, that's loca, are you crazy? That's the daily machine. They could, they could kill you. What were you doing out there? You could have been hurt. And I said, fighting for our right to our education. And you know what? We won. We won. They shut that school down and they built the new Benito Juarez High School. And it was a beautiful high school. We've had beautiful, many, many kids graduate and go on to be successful. But we're, you know, barrio families and we did the same thing. You know, our families worked hard and had little, but we all worked together to contribute. It was not an easy neighborhood to grow up in. There were gangs, there was drugs, there was violence. Um, I went to more funerals and I did weddings. We're lucky to get to quinceaneras because a lot of my generation died young because of drug overdoses and because of gang warfare amongst each other. And so it was a real hard time, you know, to survive as a young woman and to see my friends dying and going to funerals. So, you know, I thought education is the way I have to keep going. I can't give up on this dream. So, you know, my grandparents had a third grade education and one grandmother had 12 children. My other grandmother had seven. The most phenomenal women, the most inspiring women, the most loving, caring women. Mandonas, they, they took charge. They made sure everybody was fed and clean. And we scrubbed clothes in the bathtub and the ringer washer and you hung them out on the porch or out in the yard. You know, we just did everything we could to make our way. And my parents had a sixth or seventh grade education and they said to me, eighth grade is enough. Mija, you know, a, an eighth grade education will get you far. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want to go to high school. And my dad said, no, no, Mija, you don't need to go to high school. You're just going to get married and have children. And I said, well, I can do that too. I can do that too. And I cried all summer long until they couldn't take it. And they let me go to high school to see how far I'd get. Maybe she'll quit. You know, maybe she won't like it. But I hung in there and I was the first in my family to graduate from high school. And in that time, I um, 
was very active in my community. And I, my first job out of high school was a, a Latino youth. We worked to develop an alternative high school because the high schools in the area were a lot of our um, friends and family were dropping out. And this was an alternative high school that one-on-one -on -one helped people to get their GEDs. And in that job as an outreach worker and getting information out to the community that these servicios in the city are for you too, you're a taxpayer, you should have these services too. I brought home my first paycheck and I showed it to my parents and my dad looked and he walked away. And I said to my mom, what happened? What, why isn't he happy for me? And he left the house and she said, Mija, you make more money than your dad in a week. I was shocked and I was hurt because I thought, how, how is that possible that I could make more money than my dad with a high school diploma and he's been working all his life? risking his life, a window washer, washing windows on, on Michigan Avenue across from the Art Institute of Chicago. He would go up as high as 60 floors on the outside of these buildings, risking his life to provide for us. And I was making more money than him in one week working as an outreach worker. These are the things that inspired me to go further and to keep helping my comunidad. I um. I left that job and I worked outreach most of my life, um, part-time, full-time. I was, I moved, I got married, I was raising my family. I did outreach work again, educating people about HIV AIDS when nobody wanted to talk about sex. When I talked about alcohol drug prevention education and how alcoholism was hurting our families and how it was a multi-generational disease and how we had to help each other to overcome all of the addiction issues. I worked with the farm workers in Ohio during the drought, trying to get people home because there was no work. I was proud to do this work because I knew that this was the work that my abuelos did to get us here. And it was my responsibility to give back. And when I heard the stories of how much suffering my grandparents and my parents went through, I wanted to make a difference to make sure that I could do whatever I could in the communities I lived in to help la comunidad, to help los familias, because there was too much discrimination and injustice. And unless we could speak the language fluently and assert ourselves, and as others on this program have said, you know, speak for those who can't speak. I was inspired to do that. Just know that what you're doing is e not easy work. And I worked jobs and I went to school part-time. It took me 12 years to acquire my degree as I was a mother and as I was working, but I never gave up summers, weekends. Um, I just did everything could, weekend college. So stay on the path. If I can do it, you can do it. Even if you stop out and you start again, remember your dream, pursue it, help others along the way. I want to say that because of all these amazing women in my family, even though the old ways were different, they're treasured ways. And in becoming myself, I bring them with me. And I know that I'm here because of them. I stand on their shoulders and I'm proud of them. And I tell stories now about my abuela's journey from Mexico and it's called Monarchs to Matriarchs. I talk about the journey of most of us coming this way and then the generation that flies back to reclaim our ancestry. I really am proud in this community to share about our traditions. People misunderstand who we are unless we explain who we are, we learn about them and they learn about us. So with that, I just wanna say that I'm very proud of you. You are the dream. Our ancestors dreamt of us and we are their dreams that came true. I wanna give you a quote from Alma Luis Villanueva. The sacred is not in heaven or far away. It is all around us and small human rituals can connect us to its presence. And of course, the greatest challenge is to see the sacred in each other. You are the sacred to me and I thank you for your attention tonight and I'm so proud to be here with amongst these amazing phenomenal women. Gracias a ustedes y Dios le bendiga. Thank you Em. How, what a wonderful evening. Beautiful wonderful women who share their stories with us. Stories of challenge and struggle and triumph and ah uh, 
is wonderful. Um, so we have some time left. If anyone would like to um, ask questions of our panelists or put something into the chat, Monica, I think you're looking at the chat, but uh, please, if anyone has any questions or comments about um, the wonderful stories we heard from our sheroes, uh, please. We have, uh, we just have a, a I also want to uh, welcome and thank uh, our Facebook Live uh, for also joining in and visiting and, and listening to your amazing stories. Uh, just absolutely, absolutely amazing. Uh, very powerful women, beautiful backgrounds. And, uh, you know, my favorite is, you know, uh, Ms. De La Rosa, when you mentioned about the boots, you know, putting on those boots and just working it through. <laughs> I love it. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have some people thanking us for this wonderful opportunity. And I, I want everyone to know here that uh, we're not letting these women go. We're not letting them go. They're, they're, they're with us. And um, I think one of them said they wanted to be your tias. So um, welcome to the Aguila Familia, the Tias of Aguila. That's wonderful. We're getting, we're getting little claps. We're, that's wonderful. Any, any um, remarks from any of the panelists I uh, want to make? Um, it's, the floor is yours, ladies. So I do want to share, if you're not reading the chat, it does say, thank you so much for the stories. We're very and so empowering. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you. And then so empowering. Thank you for sharing. Uh, again, I just can't, I'm second, I'm just kind of reading some of the, the messages that are on here as well. Ladies, it was a success. You've done it. You've done it. Think of all the little semitas you've planted. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. We keep receiving some thank yous. Um, this is wonderful. I want to add some music to my story next time. That was wonderful. That was great, Valentina. Yes, but come back. We'll I come cheated. Back. I know I was going to, I was actually going to send a message out this morning and be like, I'm cheating. I'm going to add music. But I didn't know if it would work because I needed a DJ and my kids are like, I'm not helping. And I was at the last <laughs> minute, at the last minute, somebody came through. Oh. <laughs> One of the kids. <laughs> Thanks yes. so much for allowing me to tell these stories and to allow me to sit here and listen to these stories once again. This is awesome. There you go, Monica. There's some chat. So uh, from Mrs. Contreras, uh, it says, as an attorney, how do you find your work-life balance to be? Mm, work-life balance. Um, I would say sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's not not um I think and maybe that's true for most of us it's very cyclical and and I and I can handle it and enjoy it as long as there are cycles where whoo work is front center front and center and you know there were times when I worked for the governor for example when I was a young prosecutor when I worked for the governor I mean these were things that took a lot of time we were very busy so I would, when I worked in the governor's office, I would come home at a decent time, like six, and I would spend, you know, like two hours with my kids and my husband, and then I would put them to bed and take a nap. And then I would work from like 11 at night to maybe one, two, three in the morning. And that schedule actually worked for that period of time, but you couldn't do that forever. So there were times when um, it really, you know, uh, being in the Obama administration I'll, had a period like that. Um, but other times where, you know, I've taken a break. Uh, my, my son, um, you know, we had some health issues in our family and I didn't work for about, you know, six months. Um, when they were little, I work uh, sometimes part-time. So, you know, I try to listen to myself um, what is my body telling me? What is my soul kind of telling me? 
about that particular moment in time. And sometimes you just, you know, even though there are amazing opportunities ahead of you, uh, for me, sometimes that's just not going to be the road that I take at that time because, you know, more attention needs to be um, at home. And I've never regretted any of those decisions. It's, it's always worked out. And I just try to trust my gut and where it, what I feel like, like for me, what, where does my faith, where do I feel like God is kind of leading me uh, personally and following that. Thank you, January. What else do we have? I'm muted. Uh, it says, uh, Valentina says, thank you for bringing music. It really brought life to the uh, story to the life, uh, story to life. Um, so, okay, I have to do this because, you know, my mom's watching and I have to make sure that I say this correctly because I am not fluent in Spanish, but I'm going to try, right? Si se puede. See, right? Here it goes. Okay. Gracias a todas. Fue un placer escuchar de tantas mujeres tan ma maravillosas como ustedes. Estoy muy agradecido. Did I, I hope I said that correct. <laughs> so, good job. <laughs> I am so excited. That is Luis Aguilera. Um, he is he is one of our alumni. He was a he graduated from ASU. He did so much work. If you're still on there, Mijo, I am so very proud of you and so happy to see that you're listening because um, it's because of you and, and the work that you've done that that so many have, have been successful. He worked with Teach for America. I remember when he ran from the one office to others, Mrs. H, Mrs. H, I found Teach for America. And he did some amazing work, uh, a very giving and loving soul um, from Venezuela. Mijo, thank you for joining us. He was a wonderful panel. I'm a wonderful panel, thank you. He teaches Spanish. AP, AP Spanish for native speakers in Memphis, Tennessee. Of course, mijo, you're somewhere else doing great things. Oh, I can wonder. It, it, it is a it is a wonderful work, and I am so appreciative for those of you who are taking the time to do this for our students in particular, because they right now they really need to hear these stories. Of, of inspiration, of strength, and you know, meeting those challenges and all the things that you do, that right now is when they really need to hear these stories. And I am so very grateful to you. Uh, all our staff is, and I mean, we're a nonprofit, so none of us are getting rich, but you know, we get rich through the, through the work that we do because it fills our hearts. Uh, our, our cup is overflowing with uh, mm -hmm. comments like from Juliana Juju. We call her Juju. She she loved the music from in Valentinas. She's she's our little songstress actress. She's so of course she loved the music, and uh, I know that one of our one of our staff is on Lisa Lopez Rich. This is a real funny story. She came to volunteer for us, and I said, "Man, she looks familiar." And then lo and behold, we're related. She looks just like my mother. And, and she is saying she loved it and that it, it brought tears to her eyes to hear about Araceli. So wonderful. Oh, my Luis. Un abrazo y un beso, Mrs. H. Hablamos con I had to yes. practice and get all my tears out because oh. yesterday the kids were like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm writing this thing and I didn't think I would be so emotional about it. I haven't thought about these things for the 20 year a lot, lot many years yes. and then i think when 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 we share these stories it triggers stories in us right and then those those stories come forward and and we remember and it feels good and you know remember that our parents our abuelas and it just um it's just a wonderful wonderful thing and we're so glad we're doing this because it's not just a formal education. It is what we receive from each other, right? It's those stories. We, you know, and, and of course, to understand or connect to our ancestors, like I said before, we can swab our DNA swab, but it's the stories. It's the stories we need to pass on because, see, no, 
it dies, right? It's over. And we have to make sure. I love Professor Delegada's, uh, yes, I've gone through Fort Stockton. Yes, I have gone through there on my way to San Antonio, <laughs> driving my daughter to school. So yes, I said, whoa, what is this? But wonderful stories. I'm, I'm so, so happy. And we are so blessed to this have This generation you. is surviving a pandemic and getting an education. And they are gonna tell phenomenal stories to their next generation and their littles. But no one has done what they have done like we past year. And I really admire their persistence and they're not giving up to you know, continue their education during a pandemic. Michael tells us, and he's he's our he's uh, he takes care of us. He tells us that a survey link has been emailed, has emailed to everyone. If they could please complete it for us, thank you. We believe this is, and we partner with the Arizona Humanities. This is it. This is the humanities. These are our stories, our past coming forward to our present, helping each other to move forward and to reach our goals and to serve others. So I'm so grateful. I, I don't, I don't want to leave. <laughs> like, like the other day we met to prepare. I just don't want to leave them. I love them. It's my new hermanas. I love them. So I am Mrs. H, the mother of Aguila. And these are my hermanas, the tias of Aguila. Thank you, yeah. ladies, so very much. Music, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.